True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Skylar was a really good kid. She really was. Or even she was a good baby. Even she seldom cried. She was a happy kid. And that's the way we wanted to raise her, to be a happy child. As Skylar got a little bit older, she was kind of backward and kind of shy. And uh, she uh, would uh, see a friend of hers, classmate or so, in a <clears throat> Walmart or wherever, and she would walk clear in the other aisle so she wouldn't have to say hi. And kind of, it, it was kind of awkward for her. She was in the band at a point. She liked to play the flute. She was very good at it. Skylar had a smile that could light up a room, okay? And me and her mom used to pull up there and get ready for her to come out from work and pick her up, take her home. And we would see her out working, and she'd turn around at whoever she was looking at and smile, and God, but just made us smile, seeing her smile like that and light up the room. She came home from her shift at Wendy's. She always smelled like french fries when she got home, so she always wanted her clothes washed immediately. And uh, she came in and said, uh, I'm really, really tired. I had a long day, had a really busy night. I'm just going to go ahead and go to bed. And she said, I love you, Mom. She reached down, hugged her, and kissed her. And something was rare because she came over to me and said, I love you, Dad, and kissed me. And for her to tell you she loved you, she did that a lot. Every single time she came out to get something to drink, love you, Mom, love you, Dad, and go back to her room. But for her to come over and hug you and kiss you, for Mom, it was not rare. But for me, it was kind of rare because I'm the dad. You know, they don't, they're they too big to kiss their dad, you know. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Just a quick suggestion before we begin. This holiday season, give the gift of safety with Sabre, the number one brand of pepper spray trusted by police and consumers worldwide. Sabre offers maximum strength pepper spray and gel and other great devices to keep everyone safe this holiday season. This includes attention-grabbing personal alarms and also easy-to-install home security options as well. Go to sabred.com slash truecrimebrewery and use code TRUECRIME to get 20% off your order. That's S-A-B-R-E-R-E-D dot com slash true crime brewery. On July 5th, 2012, 16-year-old Skylar Niece returned to her family's West Virginia apartment after working an evening shift at Wendy's. Her apartment complex's surveillance video showed that Skylar snuck out of the apartment through her bedroom window at 12.30 a.m. on July 6th and got into an unknown vehicle. Her father said that she didn't take her cell phone charger and that her bedroom window was left open, as if she planned on coming home before morning. But she was never seen again. Skylar was an only child who her parents would describe as a good kid, but in the months leading up to her disappearance, Skylar had begun hanging out with some rebellious and troubled friends, smoking pot, drinking, and joyriding around town. In the investigation that followed, Facebook posts and messages would reveal a very strained relationship between Skylar and two of her best friends. Police believed this social media trail could help them find Skylar, but the truth was something that would shock everyone and break her parents' hearts. Join us at the Quiet End today for Cruel and Unusual, a discussion of a young life callously cut short by those who no one, even Skylar, would have ever suspected. And I have a West Virginia beer today. And I think it's the first West Virginia beer we've done. I this. can't recall doing another West Virginia case. I couldn't either. And what we're going to do is Nate's Nut Brown Ale by Chestnut Brew Works in Morgantown, West Virginia. So it's close by where all this action happened. Very close, yes. So it's a brown ale, as, as the name implies. <laughs> Uh, and these tend to be sweet, malty, nutty types of beers. So this particular one's a dark brown color, has a little tan head, just kind of sits there. Uh, the aroma is pretty sweet, sweet malt, and some nuts. And with the taste, I get caramel and hazelnut. Pretty pleasant. It's a light to medium body beer, pretty easy drinker. Only 5% alcohol by volume, so put a few down. And... Uh, 
It's an enjoyable beer. All right, let's open it up. Okay. All right, so now the cast is off. We're getting around a little better. Let's go down to the quiet end. Now, I've been on the lookout for a local Santa like we had back in New England. Remember, at the bar at Christmas time, we always had kind of a Billy Bob bad Santa yeah, type always, of guy. We always said, oh, there's the bad Santa. So I'm on the lookout. I haven't seen one yet, but we'll keep our eyes open. It's still early. Well, it's just a few days after Thanksgiving, so. It's plenty of time. Yeah, but now they just start celebrating Christmas and decorating after Halloween. It's gotten ridiculous. That's true. Yeah. So the Santas will be about before you know it. And they'll need to stop at their local watering hole after work and relax and unwind. Absolutely. That's what I'm thinking. So Skylar Niece was the only daughter of Mary and David Niece, parents who struggled to provide her with the necessities of life. Anything extra was rarely part of the nieces' lives. But when they were, Mary and Dave made sure Skylar had them before they did. And even though life's luxuries were often out of their reach, the nieces always gave Skylar their unconditional love and attention. Yeah, this was a close little family, mom and dad and daughter. They were. These were people that were working people. They basically lived from paycheck to paycheck. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, long before Skylar was born, Mary, her mom, had a long-time crush on her husband-to-be, DJ Dave, a local disc jockey who worked the local bar circuit. She didn't know if he knew her, but she always looked her best in case he noticed her. He had long brown hair, and he wore a leather jacket like the Fonz. <laughs> but this was cool at the time. She liked it. Yeah. Yeah. So Mary thought he was cute, and his warm smile made Mary really want to get to know him. One night after the music had ended, Mary and her girlfriends were leaving a local bar where they had gone to celebrate someone's birthday. They noticed a large crowd gathering outside and saw Dave on the ground with blood on his mouth. Mary pushed through the crowd to find out who was responsible for this. Somebody said that three rough-looking men had jumped Dave as he was walking to his car. Mary leaned over him and told Dave she was taking him to the hospital. Once there, sitting inside a tiny exam room, a doctor said Dave's injuries weren't serious. He wouldn't be talking for a while, though, because his jaw was broken and they had to wire it shut while it healed. So Dave, according to him, Dave felt at that point like he was seeing Mary clearly for the first time that night. Well, she really stepped in and helped him out, didn't she? She sure did. So Dave said something to her like, well, since I won't be talking for a while... I should go ahead and ask you out now, and he asked her to a movie. So Mary was happy. She was realizing her dream of dating this cute DJ. And as soon as Dave was released from the hospital, he did take her out to a movie. Even though he couldn't talk for the next three months, Mary felt like he was the one for her. So he did manage to communicate. Yes, he did. <laughs> when Mary became pregnant, though, she wasn't happy. This was unplanned. And the thought of raising a child terrified her, because she believed she wasn't ready to be a mother. But still, she decided that she wouldn't end the pregnancy. And when Skylar was born, of course, Mary fell in love with her instantly. But Mary wasn't sure she wanted a husband, even after she found out that she was pregnant. But Dave was a persistent guy. He kept proposing, and Mary kept putting him off. She even hesitated when he said that they should move in together. But then after Skylar's birth, Mary and Dave did move in together, and this arrangement seemed to work. As the years passed, Skylar became kind of a miniature version of Mary, and people compared her to her mother, right down to her joyfulness, her stubbornness, and her occasional tempers. Dave and Skylar were best buddies, and Mary and Skylar were very intertwined, as only mothers and daughters can be when they're very close like this. And their family photos show their physical similarities as well because Skylar had those same bright blue eyes as Mary, and they both have a little mischievous smile in the pictures. So, money might have been scarce in the household, but love was always plentiful. Skylar's parents lived paycheck to paycheck her entire life. They hadn't even taken their first family vacation until the summer of 2000, when Skylar was four years old. They chose Ocean City, Maryland, which was a six-hour drive away, so Skylar could see the beach for the first time. 
Now, one sad part about this was the only reason that they could even afford the vacation was because Mary had been nearly killed previous year in a car accident. A few days before Thanksgiving 1999, Mary drops Skylar off at Pleasant Day Daycare. On the way home, she is behind, driving behind a lumber truck, and the truck missed its turnoff, stopped abruptly, and began to back up. Mary blared the horn and tried to put her car in reverse quickly, but she wasn't quick enough. God, that would be terrifying. Yeah, can't you imagine watching that thing? Having this giant down truck back up towards you? Yeah. Holy crap, no. So the, the truck began to climb up over her hood, and she threw her left arm up in reflex and the airbags engaged, snapping the bones in her forearm. When she came to, her left arm was hanging over the steering wheel and was bleeding. She had to lift it off the steering column with her other hand. Obviously, she was quite relieved that Skylar hadn't been in the car. Probably would have killed her. Well, I don't know. She um, would have been in the back seat, I well, would hope. We, we would hope. But yeah. She's a four-year-old. Well, she wasn't even four because this was yeah. before the vacation, three so she was probably three. A metal plate, two operations, and several months later, Mary's arm was functioning at nearly 100%. So she's really kind of lucky that's all that happened. No kidding. She could have been crushed and killed. And the insurance company offered a settlement to cover the medical expenses. Yeah, and as restitution. Restitution for what? what for pain you? and suffering. Wasn't a huge amount, but it was enough for a little trip to the beach. Yeah, and Skylar would become a big fan of the ocean, but she didn't like it on that first visit. She was small, of course, and the waves kept knocking her over, and it frightened her. But she did love the hotel's swimming pool, as most kids do. In the pool, she was absolutely fearless. In new situations, she was watchful and held back, and then she plunged right in. Skylar was very willful, her parents would say. She would decide what she would do or what she wouldn't do, no matter what her parents or anyone else had to say about it. With the unconditional love she received, Skylar had a deep and unbreakable bond with her parents. Although it seemed like she was a bit of a daddy's girl, her world really revolved around her mother. My mom, of course, is the most important person in my life, Skylar once wrote in her English journal. She not only cares for me, but she also listens to me, and I know I can talk to her. I think it's important for parents not only to take care of their children, but to make sure their kids can talk to them. So that gives us a little look into Skylar's mind there. She was raised in a way where it didn't matter to her that she didn't have as many toys and clothes as the other kids, or that her family didn't take as many trips as other families. Having fewer possessions seemed to ground her, making her care more than many of her peers about social problems like bigotry, global warming, racial discrimination, poverty. Skylar also hated injustice and was full of empathy. At an early age, she began to stand up for the underdogs. When Dave used to make fun of gay people, Skylar was the one that made him stop. She would punch him and say, Stop it, Dad. They're people too, you know. So Dave would say he learned a lot from his young daughter. Skylar's empathy and compassion could also be seen in her schoolwork. In her honors English class, she wrote a poem for Ryan DeVinney the former West Virginia University student who was beaten so badly in November 2009 he was put into a persistent vegetative state. Skylar's first friend, Morgan Lawrence, also came from a loving home. Skylar and Morgan, also an only child, were best friends. They first met at preschool and then reunited as kindergartners. Now, unlike Skylar's parents, Morgan's father was a white-collar professional. He was a physician working as the chief of the local emergency room. Having more money meant that, unlike Skylar's parents, Morgan's mother was usually available to pick up the kids after school. So Morgan's mom, Cheryl Lawrence, became like Skylar's second mother. All through kindergarten, she brought Skylar home with Morgan and kept her until Mary picked her up after work. At the Lawrence's home, the two little girls would play together, and sometimes they fought just like sisters would. David and Cheryl Lawrence were very down-to-earth. Skylar and her parents were very comfortable with them. They recognized the nieces as a family that shared the same values they had, and they also saw Skylar as a good influence for Morgan. In the fifth grade, Morgan believed she and Skylar would be best friends forever. What Morgan was really looking forward to with Skylar, and Skylar with her, was when they would be bridesmaids at each other's weddings. 
It was a promise they made to each other when they were little girls because neither of them had a sister. The year after kindergarten, Skylar and a boy named Daniel were in first grade together, and Daniel would later become Skylar's closest confidant when she confided in anyone at all that was. Because Skylar tended to keep her feelings to herself as she got older and as she entered adolescence. Even as a small child, Skylar showed signs of being a very private person. She didn't share much with anyone, not even her parents. Skylar and Daniel's friendship grew stronger because Dave had done handyman work for Daniel's mom while his dad was working overseas. And when Dave came by their house, he would bring Skylar along. So the two kids would entertain themselves playing life or battleship for hours on end. When they suspected Dave was about finished, they'd actually take their game inside a closet and hide so that they could play as long as possible. So that's pretty cute. Yeah, they had fun. Sounds like a a pretty nice childhood. It really does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It just shows you you don't need to have a lot to have a nice childhood. That's right. So Sheila Eddy became friends with Skylar when they were in the second grade. Over the summer, the two girls spent weekdays at the community pool together. Their playdates continued almost every weekend through the winter as well. During the school year, Skylar spent her after-school hours at Morgan's house, but during the summertime, she was often a visitor in Sheila's house. It wasn't surprising that Sheila and Skylar ended up becoming friends at such an early age because their moms, Mary Niece and Tara Eddie Clendenin, were close to the same age and had known each other back when they were teens. Like Skylar, Sheila was also an only child. Also like Skylar, her parents came from the small West Virginia towns, and they didn't have a lot of money either. Now, when Sheila was about two years old, her father was in a severe car accident. Greg Eddy sustained brain damage and was left partially paralyzed. A family friend said Greg has made mistakes, as we all have, but he has a good heart. What do you make of that? Was that because he was driving drunk or something? I think so. That's what I took from it when I read about it. As a single parent, Sheila's mom struggled to make ends meet. She worked in Morgantown but wanted a better life for her daughter. So she took college classes in hopes of becoming an accountant. Now, as a child, Sheila showed signs of having what you might term personality eccentricities and attention-craving behaviors. One family member described a time when they were out at a restaurant eating, and Sheila refused to sit down. She ate her entire meal standing up. Her odd behavior continued as she grew older, but her friends and family explained them away, saying that she was an only child and was the center of her mother's life. Sheila's parents were divorced before Sheila entered kindergarten. In a nearby section of Morgantown called Evansdale, Rachel Schoff was growing up as the only daughter of a small business owner. Rusty Schoff owned and managed a clothing boutique, while Rachel's mother Patricia was a stay-at-home mom. Rusty's first wife had died of cancer, leaving him a widower with a young son. When he met and married Patricia, his family thought he was really rushing into this new relationship too soon. But soon they had a baby girl, and that was Rachel. One family friend said she became everything to her parents. Before long, Rusty's store went out of business. He and his son Kevin moved out, and the marriage ended in divorce. Rachel was four years old when her parents' marriage ended. As they entered their teens and they got cell phones, Skylar and Sheila called or texted each other several times a day. The summer before Sheila moved to Morgantown, Skylar often stayed at Sheila's house. Sheila's neighbors said they didn't see anything out of the ordinary during those visits. Skylar seemed friendly and sociable, and the two girls would walk to the nearby grocery store, or they'd hang outside on the front porch and talk with local boys when Sheila's mother Tara was at work. Now Tara began dating a man named Jim Clendenden, and people have said that Sheila didn't like him. Even though he mined coal for a living, he didn't seem like your average coal miner because he wore jewelry and he got pedicures. So Skylar and Sheila often teased Tara about those things. There was a time, maybe during a heated argument about her mother's boyfriend, when Sheila was overheard threatening to kill Tara. Neighbors said Sheila seemed odd, and an older girl across the street from Tara's old apartment said Sheila was also mean, calling her a whore after the teenager got pregnant. So Tara decided to marry Jim, and that led to many changes in Sheila's life. She had a new stepfather, obviously, 
and an upscale townhouse outside Morgantown. In addition to having a new husband who worked as a foreman for a local union company, Tara now had financial security. And so did Sheila. Jim's income added luxuries to the lives of both mother and daughter. Sheila could finally wear the expensive designer clothing she'd always wanted. She could also get her hair done professionally and could go to the mall for manicures. This move meant that Sheila transferred to Schuyler's High School, and her new home was only 10 minutes from the Schuyler's Star City apartment. Sheila and Schuyler were excited about the idea of being together all the time. In October 2010, Sheila transferred to UHS, University High School, as a ninth grader, and she requested a class schedule identical to Schuyler's. Rachel didn't enter their lives until both girls were 14, and by then Schuyler's friendship with Sheila seemed to be annoying her other friends. Other girls said that Sheila was mean and controlling, and they saw a change in Schuyler's behavior, which they blamed on her relationship with Sheila. It impacted her other friendship so much that by the end of middle school, Morgan and Schuyler weren't together very often. Many of Morgan's friends came from well-off families with parents who had white-collar jobs, and Morgan didn't feel her family was any better than Schuyler's, but some of the kids at the high school did. Some of them tried to exclude Schuyler from their group activities. Some of the wealthier kids, the mean-spirited ones, actually referred to kids from working-class backgrounds as the dirty kids, or simply the dirties. Schuyler was aware of this and it hurt her feelings, of course, and it got in the way of her friendship with Morgan. Schuyler and Sheila met Rachel when the three had a class together. From then on, wherever Schuyler and Sheila were, there was Rachel. Now, this was okay with Schuyler, who made friends with just about everybody. While they were freshmen, Sheila, Rachel, and Schuyler became a well-known trio in the UHS hallways. Schuyler was thrilled when Sheila had transferred there. Schuyler and Sheila had been friends since second grade. Now, Sheila was kind of boy crazy and was always on her cell phone. She also had connections and could get weed for them to smoke when they went out on weekends. So it seems like a lot of the trouble began when Sheila transferred into Schuyler's school. Sheila had been popular at her old school, but at UHS she was an unknown. When Sheila didn't become instantly popular there, she used her looks and her sexuality to get attention. She may have become promiscuous, I'm not sure. UHS teens would say that Sheila was the least liked of the three girls. Unlike Sheila, Rachel was surrounded by her childhood friends, many of whom also came from St. Francis, the Catholic school. And unlike Schuyler, Rachel's family had money. Rachel was known for her Catholic faith and her volunteer work during Special Olympics. She was a talented singer and an aspiring actress. So she seemed to really be going places. That she did. So Schuyler was different than other kids. She was tiny, five foot two. She was an environmentalist and kind of a champion of the underdog. She walked around with an energetic bounce, smiling all the time. She did well on her exams, she did her friend's homework, and she insisted that she was going to go to law school. As a likable and hardworking honors student, she was the smartest of the three. She applied herself the most. By the time they became friends, though, they became inseparable. But their relationship would be tainted by tension, distrust, and chronic fighting. During those two years, Schuyler must have assumed these friendships were worth the drama because she hung in there. She well, was, there was a lot of drama. There sure was, I mean, which isn't that unusual for teen girls. No, I mean, I, was, I would have said that myself. <laughs> but it, it seems like as you're entering high school, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, that can be when a lot of issues can arise. Absolutely. And it's always hard to have a group of three. Well, there's always one on the outside. Seems like it, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, Skylar wasn't bothered outwardly by the two-on-one disputes that happened in their group of three. Or maybe she just tolerated the problems for the sake of having fun and partying, convincing herself that things would get better. Yeah, that's reasonable if you think about it in terms of most adolescent relationships. There are a lot of ups and downs. There certainly are. But in this case, it was the worst mistake Skylar ever made. 
She was really putting her trust in the wrong people, and she didn't know it. Now, like I said, Rachel was a gifted singer. The drama teacher was really excited to have her on his team, and the other students were impressed by her. She was actually gifted enough that they felt she might be famous someday, and this made her very popular. It was different with Sheila, though. Other than her childhood friends, the only students who spoke well of her were a few boys who considered her a fellow hippie type. One of them was a UHS student named Frankie, and he had known Sheila since the third grade. He said she was just the sweetest girl. He said that they smoked weed, did coke, and took Roxaset together. They also had sex together, so I don't know if he was the best friend for her to get involved with. <laughs> as it turns out. So as with Sheila and Skylar remaining friends, Daniel and Skylar had remained good friends throughout elementary, middle, and high school. Now, Daniel often found Sheila annoying, but she never interfered with Skylar and Daniel's friendship. Because, yeah, maybe it was because he was a boy. Sure, maybe Sheila didn't see him as competition, which she might have with Skylar's female friends. Many girls who were friends of Skylar over the years said that Sheila tried to push them away. So there's some evidence that, yeah, she would view females as kind of rivals. Yeah, she didn't want Skylar to have other friends, but right. then she kind of glommed on to Rachel. Mm-hmm. But Daniel often joined Skylar, Sheila, and Rachel on their weekend joy rides. He also hung out with the three of them before classes or during lunch. Now, he and Rachel performed in high school plays together, and he said that they had never argued. He also said he never had an argument with Skylar, either. Yeah, but I think it was easier for him because he wasn't that involved, and like you said, he was a guy. Yeah, and he didn't, didn't have romantic interests in any of the girls. They were just buddies. I think so. That's my take on it anyway. Right. So why don't we take a moment here and talk about today's sponsors? Yeah, I have an exciting announcement to make on behalf of Payne Lindsay and Oxygen. In a one-night special TV event, Oxygen brings to life Payne Lindsay's hit true crime podcast, Up and Vanished. In 2016, Payne took a deep dive into the disappearance of Tara Grinstead, a young teacher who went missing 13 years ago. Payne has dedicated himself to Tara's case every day, slowly unlocking the secrets that her small town just couldn't shake. Tara was last seen on October 21, 2005, in Osceola, Georgia. She was heading home from a barbecue and suddenly went missing. Tara's story remained a mystery for over a decade. Then Payne stepped in. His search for the truth got the town to start talking, and the Up and Vanish podcast became a national phenomenon, reaching over 240 million people. But the story doesn't end there. Payne is still at work, determined to find answers. So don't miss Up and Vanished. It's a one-night TV special event based on the hit podcast. And you can see it on Oxygen, the new network for crime. This episode is also sponsored by ADT. ADT can design and install a smart home just for you, backed by 24-7 protection. And there are a vast number of things you can do with your own secure smart home. ADT has doorman service, which is an automation that can unlock doors for package deliveries, friends, or that kid who keeps forgetting his keys. Another really cool service of ADT Smart Homes is Turndown Service. This ADT automation arms your security system, locks your doors, and even turns down your lights and thermostat. They think of everything. They even offer worry-free getaway service, which lets you arm your system, lock up, and set lighting schedules before you go on vacation. And this is all controlled from the ADT app or the sound of your voice and backed by ADT's 24-7 protection. Best of all... With ADT, you don't have to worry about installing and configuring your system. ADT will do it for you. Yeah, they really have excellent customer service, and I found them to be really patient in explaining how the new service works. Well, they have to be with us illiterate. That's right. We're not really tech savvy, so it helps. That's for sure. So if this all sounds good to you, just visit ADT.com smart to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. Great. Well, let's get back to the story. Now, by the time they were teenagers and in high school, Skylar's relationship with Sheila and later Rachel really dominated her world. Rachel's friends said it seemed like Sheila was trying to control Rachel 
and they said they could see the bad effect Sheila was having on her. Skylar's friends were worried about that with Skylar, too, but both girls were ignoring their other friends' concerns. Rachel and Skylar became even closer to Sheila, until the three-way friendship turned very troubled, and Skylar was becoming left out as kind of the odd girl out. So Skylar had taken to sneaking out of the house at night while Mary worked at Ruby Memorial Hospital. At that time, Dave worked part-time making advertising signs for company cars, and money continued to be tight for the nieces. One warm spring night, Skylar had a plan to go joyriding with Sheila. And we know what joyriding is, don't we? Yeah, it's kind of riding around aimlessly. Yeah. And for this younger generation, they text. Yeah, they don't talk to each other. Right. And, of course, they were getting high a lot of the time, too. Yeah, you know, smoke a little weed, drive around. Smoking the weed, right. Now, Skylar and Sheila had gone joyriding many times, but Mary and Dave didn't know about that. Because neither girl had a license, Skylar had talked to Floyd Pancoast, a friend of hers, and got him uh, to be the driver. He was 19 and a bit of an outcast, but Skylar was his friend. She was a friend to the underdogs. Right. So if, if she's looking at this guy who's kind of on the outs with people, yeah, she's going to stand up for him. I think so. kind of person that she was. Yeah. So they picked up Rachel and Sheila, who lived just a few minutes away from Skylar. Now the car with the teenagers was cruising a little too fast in Star City when a police officer noticed and pulled them over. Star City had a 10 p.m. curfew for anyone under age 18, and the officer thought some of the car's occupants appeared younger than that. When he made his way up to the driver's window after pulling them over, his suspicions were confirmed. The girls were all underage. He drove the three girls to the Star City police station, then called Rachel's and Sheila's fathers to come get them. The two teens had intentionally not given him their mother's cell phone numbers. Rachel said her mom would get violent, and Sheila knew that her dad would go easier on her. Yeah, neither mother immediately knew what happened because both dads snuck their daughters back in their house without telling them. But Skylar didn't know about that. The nieces didn't have a home phone, and neither Dave nor Mary had a cell phone. They used the little bit of money they had to make sure Skylar had a cell phone in case of an emergency. So the police had no way to reach her parents. So the policeman loaded Skylar into the back of his patrol car and he drove her home himself. And according to Mary, Skylar was really beside herself crying. She kept saying Rachel's mom was going to beat her daughter up because she snuck out. Rachel had repeatedly told Skylar and Sheila about beatings that she got from her mother. So Skylar was yelling that it was all her fault. And she had been the instigator of the plan, so Mary thought it was appropriate for her to feel some guilt. But she also told her she can't be doing that. She can't be sneaking out. And she was worried, you know, do you even know these boys that well? What if they hurt you? You could have been raped or killed. So Mary and Dave both agreed that Skylar had punished herself enough. And they didn't ground her or give her any punishment for that. They believed she'd learned her lesson. Looking back at events leading up to the murder, though, Mary would remember that Skylar's personality had been changing, and she was becoming kind of angry a lot of the time. And anyone that knew her very well noticed it. She and Sheila began to argue constantly, many times because Skylar was angry at Sheila when she didn't get her way. Then there were angry tweets Skylar sent out for everyone to see in the late summer and fall of 2011. The real trouble seems to have started in late August of 2011. June, July, and early August may have been the high point of the relationship. Skylar's tweets from that time seemed happy, almost to the point of giddiness. But the big blow-up happened on August 16th, just before they returned to school. And it was loud enough to wake Rachel's mother, who separated the girls. This was almost a brawl. It was. It was physical. Yeah. Rachel had invited Sheila and Skylar over for a sleepover. This was the first and last time that they did this. And sometime after Patricia fell asleep, the girls began drinking from a bottle of vodka. Before long, all three of them were drunk, and that's when they started taking pictures of each other and kissing each other. There were rumors that Skylar took pictures or even a video of Rachel and Sheila undressed and having oral sex, followed by scissoring. 
So this was probably an uncomfortable position for Skylar to be in, if you can imagine. Well, if, if she's the odd person out here, right? She's not participating in no. this, this little game. I don't know. Was it a game? Was Skylar even interested in that? I don't think so. No. Well, afterward, all three girls slept together in Rachel's bed, or they tried to, and Sheila ordered Skylar to move over so she could cuddle with Rachel. Sheila's request angered Skylar, who began complaining, and that's when a loud and rowdy fight broke out between the two girls. Then Rachel's mom, Patricia, burst through the bedroom door, and she told them to keep it down. She took Rachel upstairs to sleep in her bedroom. But Sheila and Skylar continued fighting, so much so that Patricia had to return at least once to settle them down. So this account of that night comes from another friend, Shania, who Skylar apparently told about that night. And Mary Niece also verified the events because Skylar had written about it in her diary. Skylar didn't seem happy about it, Shania has said. Yeah, and according to one investigator who had actually read Skylar's diary, she wrote very little about Sheila and Rachel having sex, and she actually seemed more upset about the fight that she and Sheila had afterward. Skylar claimed she was mad at Sheila because whenever another person was around, Sheila was nicer to that person than she was to her. Right. Well, by then, Skylar realized that Sheila's affection for Rachel was probably more than just a platonic friendship. So she was really being replaced by Rachel and began to see her as an intruder in the relationship that she'd really had with Sheila all the way back to second grade. Skylar went on Twitter on August 21st and wrote, It's almost ridiculous how I somehow find out everything. By September, Skylar tweeted out what seemed to be a threat. It's possible the other two girls began to worry that Skylar was going to expose their sexual relationship. Whatever was going on behind the scenes, Skylar is very upset. As was obvious in her August 23rd tweet, I for real need to quit wishing death on people. Hashtag that's terrible. Hashtag karma's a bitch. Then about a month later, Rachel and Sheila began to joke, maybe, about killing Skylar. Right, so things are taking a drastic turn downward. Still, no one would imagine that what happened would happen, if that makes any sense. It does. So moodiness... That's a normal part of adolescent development. But there was much more going on beneath the surface for Skylar, it seems. After Sheila moved to Morgantown, Skylar just didn't seem to be as happy and carefree as she used to be. Now, it's difficult to say how much of that change was from Sheila's negative influence or from issues in Skylar's own life or family or the new relationship with Rachel. But there were things going on there. Skylar's friend Daniel knew that there were issues between Skylar and Sheila, even though Skylar didn't talk about them with him. She didn't complain about Rachel to him either. Which I find kind of surprising. Why? Well, because Rachel's bothering her, right? Why didn't she complain to him, who was someone that she confided in? I guess she didn't feel like she could confide in him about that for some reason. Yeah, and, and, well, and I don't know that Rachel was that huge a thorn. It was mostly Sheila. Well, Sheila had been her friend since way back, though. Yeah. So Rachel seemed to be the one that started the whole thing, started them having the problems they had. Mm -hmm. Now, Daniel was with the three girls once when Skylar told Sheila she shouldn't have inappropriately touched a male student in one of their classes. This wasn't a big fight, but Daniel said Sheila seemed annoyed with Skylar. There were some really nasty fights that Daniel witnessed between Sheila and Skylar. Didn't seem to him like Rachel was directly involved, though. One day, when he and Rachel were waiting to go on stage to practice their roles in a school play, they were hanging out in the school cafeteria. And except for them, the room was empty. Daniel said Sheila called Rachel and then added Skylar into a three-way call. Sheila deliberately didn't tell Skylar that Rachel was listening. And Rachel muted her phone so Skylar wouldn't know that she was listening. Sheila's plan was to provoke Skylar. Then Rachel pushed the speaker button and encouraged Daniel to listen when Sheila and Skylar began screaming. Rachel seemed to get great pleasure from hearing Sheila and Skylar fighting and just being upset with each other. Yeah, so the one she's fighting with more is Sheila, but it kind of seems like Rachel was behind a lot of that. 
Yeah, well, again, it's the two-on-one type of thing. Yeah, and over the next several months, things got worse. So all of the teens were going to see the newly released movie The Hunger Games, and Skylar went with Sheila and her friend Shania one Saturday night in March 2012. Now on the way, Sheila was on her phone constantly, talking, texting, using social media, even though she was the one driving. Skylar asked Sheila who she was texting, and Sheila wouldn't tell her. She almost never told her, even though Skylar constantly asked Sheila to know what she was doing and who she was communicating with. So the girls got to the movies and went inside, and Sheila sat in the middle, and Skylar was telling her to put her phone away, but Sheila kept texting. So then it escalated, and Skylar grabbed at Sheila's phone, and Sheila smacked her hand away. Then Skylar hit Sheila in the face. Then there was yelling, calling each other a bitch, and, you know, fuck off. Got really nasty. So much so that they had to leave the theater. And then after they were outside, Skylar and Sheila continued arguing in the car, while Shania sat on the curb and just kind of stayed out of it. They screamed at each other for several minutes, and then they suddenly stopped. But it was only a matter of time before these two girls would be fighting again. So nothing was solved. Right, for sure. Now, the separation between Skylar and her other good childhood friend, Morgan, began when they became sophomores. Part of the problem was Sheila. Skylar always wanted Sheila to come along with them, but Morgan just wasn't comfortable around her. You and I can go hang out, she would say to Skylar, but I really don't want to be a part of you and Sheila and Rachel. One time Morgan told Skylar, I don't think Sheila is a good influence. You're doing things I've never seen you do. So she was referring to Skylar's new habits, smoking weed, sneaking out at night, and generally behaving badly. Behaviors she thought Skylar was doing to imitate Sheila. Yeah, but Skylar said it was fine. She wasn't angry with Morgan, but she clearly thought Morgan was wrong. And her explanation was, oh, it's just how high school is. So it was in biology class where Sheila Eddy asked the student behind her, hey, do you know how to dispose of a body? And this student, Nick Tomaski, shrugged. I don't know. That show Breaking Bad has stuff like that on there, he said. Then he tried to ignore her because he knew she was kind of an instigator and a flirt. So Sheila went on, though. She said, we want to figure out what to do with Skylar. And I guess Nick just gave her a look, and Rachel said, shh, no names. So according to students in class that day, Sheila's question came after some negative comments that she and Rachel made about how much they hated Skylar. What kind of acid would you dispose of a body in? Sheila asked the biology teacher. And one student insisted that the teacher did hear this question. According to that student, The teacher said, how dare you ask that? Get out of my class and go to the office. The students said the girls did as they were told, and once there they spoke to an administrator who didn't seem to do anything but sent them back to class. So I think the problem here is no one's taking that seriously because teenagers say stupid stuff all the time. That they do. But But here's where the accounts differ. Yeah, the teacher said that he'd never heard Sheila and Rachel ask that specific question or mentioning Skylar's name in connection with it. What he did say was, as he had been instructing students about DNA, that it was very possible the girls could have asked him that sort of question with no names mentioned. Other students said Skylar's name came up in connection with the idea of disposing of a body. So I think this teacher's being a little disingenuous here. I think he's trying to minimize what he He might be. He might feel some guilt. Yeah. Although I would argue, even if they did say that and they were punished for it, no one's going to take that that seriously. What are you going to do? Lock them up and keep them away from her? Well, no, you're not going to do that. But I, I guess they could have warned the family. To, yeah, well, and I'd try to find out what the hell, what's going on. Yeah, I don't know if they would tell you anything. But I guess it's possible. Because uh, Skylar, Sheila, and Rachel had every class together but that biology class. And according to students who heard it, Skylar did go ahead and question Sheila and Rachel about it after she was told about it, and they denied it to her. Skylar was working at Wendy's, and she clocked out on July 5th, 2012 at 10 p.m. Her drive home took about 10 minutes. Once there, she sat on the arm of the recliner where her mom was sitting and hugged Mary. Love you, Mommy, she said, kissing her mom on the cheek. Then she jumped up, leaned over the couch, and kissed her dad, Dave. 
Love you, Daddy, she said. I'm really tired. I'm going to bed. So Skylar tossed her dirty clothes out the door for Mary to throw into the washing machine. This was the routine every night after Skylar finished work. So she waited for the wash cycle to end, then loaded Skylar's uniform into the dryer, turned it on, and went to bed. So the next afternoon, Dave had come home for lunch and was getting ready to return to work. He knocked on Skylar's bedroom door. Honey, get up. I want you to take me back to work, and then you can have my car, because I only have one car. Yeah. So they carpool. So she'd drop him off, and then she'd go to Wendy's and drive home from Wendy's. Yep. And she didn't have a license yet. She just had a permit. So that was a little edgy, maybe. Anyway, so he he called, but there wasn't any response from inside Skylar's room. Usually she was up as soon as she heard the car was available. Dave knew he shouldn't have been letting Skylar drive by herself, because she's supposed to have an adult in the car since she's just got the permit. But he knew she'd drive just enough to take him to work and then go to her own job, and she'd come straight home after that. That was their agreement, and she always stuck to it. So he's not getting a response from inside the room. He goes to the hall closet, grabbed a coat hanger to pop open the bedroom door. When he looked inside Skylar's bedroom, she wasn't there. Her unmade bed looked like it had been slept in, so at first Dave assumed that she must have gone shopping with a friend. Then he remembered her door had been locked from the inside, and he called Mary at work. Yeah, so he's more worried than Mary at first. He was pacing the kitchen as he talked to Mary, and Mary just told him to calm down and don't flip out. Skylar probably just went shopping with one of her friends or something, and she never misses work, so she'll definitely show up at work. And then Dave was still upset, though, because of the door being locked, and Mary told him that she probably accidentally hit the lock button while closing the door if she was leaving in a hurry. And this was possible, but Dave was still very concerned. So he drove back to his job at Walmart, which was just a few minutes away, and he told his supervisor that he had to take the rest of the day off and find his daughter. So he's worried from the beginning here. He certainly was. He seemed to be taking it a lot more seriously than his wife. Yeah. He decided to check at home again in case she'd returned while he was gone, because Skylar usually was pretty responsible. And although she might forget sometimes to let her parents know where she was going, she would usually remember at some point to check in with them. But he also knew that Skylar was kind of fearless, and that's what concerned him, that maybe she'd gotten herself into a bad situation. So she still wasn't at the apartment when he returned, and he walked through the kitchen and onto the balcony to have a cigarette. So he's taken a minute and planning his next steps. And that's when he noticed a small bench near the back wall of the apartment complex, just around the corner from Skylar's first floor room. So it hit him then that she may have snuck out of the house during the night. She had done that in the past. And he checked Skylar's window, and the screen was leaning against the wall, and her window was left open a crack. So that's when he knew that she must have snuck out at night. And this made her not being there all the more ominous. Right. And then the other part of this was that Mary had noticed bruising on Skylar's legs for some time. And she's then realizing that she is missing some clues. And they, she and Dave believe Skylar when she said she got them at work. But looking back, Mary realized she had really gotten them from sliding out over the windowsill. So they, they learned on that horrible day that Skylar hadn't learned a thing after being caught sneaking out. Yeah, she was still at it. So the nieces would discover from some of Skylar's friends that Skylar snuck out a lot. When Mary recalled Skylar's lies, she felt guilty and realized that she and Dave should have done many things differently. Many red flags had been missed. Well, sure, but I mean, it's really hard to... Hindsight's so good. Even if they'd punished her and stuff, it's kind of hard to keep a 16-year-old in the house in the middle of the night if they want to leave. Oh, it is. And what are you going to do? But back when they were caught, they didn't really punish her. No, they didn't. There wasn't any curfew or grounding or anything. No, they thought she'd learned her lesson, Yeah, but that was totally wrong. Yeah, and I'm not saying that if they had sat down and talked with her and put her on restriction for a month or something, that would have made a big difference. I don't think it would have at all, really, because she definitely would have rebelled against that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they really would have been happier if she had just been honest with them. Well, sure. So after Dave found Skylar's bench, 
and realized that she had snuck out, he immediately called Sheila, because if anyone knew where Skylar was, that would be Sheila. That afternoon, when Dave asked Sheila if she'd seen Skylar, she said no, but she did admit that she had talked to Skylar around midnight the night before. Well, Mary was growing more worried, so she left work early, and she had a really short drive home. When she arrived, Dave was still on his cell, and he was completely freaked out. He called Sheila again to ask for the phone numbers of Skylar's friends Hayden and Shania. He wasn't sure Sheila would have Hayden's number because she usually stayed away from Skylar when Sheila was around. He knew Shania was an old friend of Sheila's, though. They had gone to middle school together. With social activities, Skylar, Sheila, and Shania were actually together as often as Skylar, Sheila, and Rachel were. But when it came to their secrets, Sheila often confided in Shania, which is why Shania knew more about the Skylar, Sheila, Rachel trio than almost anyone else outside of that relationship would know. So it sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it? It does. I really don't miss being a teenager at all. So Mary thought that they could give it a little more time and see if someone would get back to them and tell them where their daughter was. But then that afternoon, the home phone rang and Mary answered. This was the Wendy's manager telling her that Skylar had never shown up for work. So this is kind of Mary's aha moment. This is when she knew something bad had likely happened to her daughter. Call 911 now, she told Dave. When the house phone rang again, it was Sheila. So we're going to change the story a little bit. Yeah, she told Mary that she needed to tell her the whole truth about what had happened last night. And she said she did see Skylar, that Skylar had snuck out around 11. And Rachel and Sheila had picked her up and they'd gone joyriding for about 45 minutes. But she said that Skylar made them drop her off at the end of the road so that they wouldn't wake Mary and Dave up. And this was something that had never happened before. She'd never asked them to do that before. No. Be- so it's a, little, it's a little hokey, a little questionable. Yeah, but the parents don't know this. True. Well, and of course they're believing Sheila. She's like a daughter to them, really. Yeah, she was. Mary realized Skylar was definitely missing. Sheila and her mom, Tara, came over to the apartment, and they actually accompanied Mary as she went door-to-door asking if anyone had seen her daughter, and Dave waited for the police to respond to the 911 call. It was Officer Bob McCauley who arrived at 4.41 p.m., And he and Dave covered the other side of the street, going door-to-door asking about Skylar. No one had seen the missing 16-year-old. Sheila did not cry during this search. Dave would describe her face as expressionless and her movements as kind of wooden. At the time, Mary thought it was because Sheila was upset and scared. Sheila's mother, Tara, cried as soon as they got to the apartment. And after the search of the neighborhood revealed nothing, The five of them went back to the apartment, and that's when Mary remembered that the apartment did have surveillance video, and she was really surprised the police hadn't checked it immediately. Why did she have to think of it? Why, indeed. Yeah. So security cameras had been installed around the small apartment building, mostly just trying to capture people attempting to break into it. Cameras also recorded the inside hallways. So Dave called the landlord who came right over. There was an unmarked door close to the niece's apartment, which led to the video room about the size of a walk-in closet. The landlord chose the view from the side of the apartment where Skylar's room was located. The camera faced the complex's parking lot, a small side street, and another another apartment building across the street. So there is a shadowy image of a car in the background. The time signature on the video read 1231. Then Skylar's head entered the picture, and she was seen walking quickly toward a car. She opened the back door and climbed into the back seat. There was no sign of any struggle or foul play. Then the car drove off, and the scene was empty again. So So, how eerie is that? Yeah, it had to be so creepy. They were actually watching their daughter disappear right before their eyes. I mean, I guess you just feel like you could stop her, you know? Yeah. So that was hard for them to watch. So the room was silent for a minute, and then finally the landlord spoke up and said that he thought that had been an SUV. On the video, the car had been very blurry. But Officer McCauley said he wasn't sure it was an SUV, and Sheila said nothing. 
Mary asked Sheila if any of Skylar's friends had a car that looked like that, and Sheila said no. After the policeman took Sheila's statement, this kind of became their official story. They were taking her word for it. His handwritten notes were the first recorded in the case. Sheila told him that she and Rachel picked up Skylar at 11 and dropped her off at the end of the street about 11.45. So by that account, she and Rachel were home and in bed by midnight. Uh, everyone viewing the video believed the vehicle they saw had to be someone else's. It couldn't be Sheila's because she drove a sporty silver Toyota Camry. Now this just blows my mind because from that video, it certainly could be her car. It could be. It was. <laughs> which, which it was. <laughs> right? Um, you know, well, I, they, they kind of got hung up on it and they thought it was an SUV, although I can't tell from that. You can tell it looked like a lighter colored car, right? Well, this is what the public and Mary and Dave are thinking, but the police knew better. They did know. They did. That something was wrong with Sheila's story as well. So the only logical explanation in Mary and Dave's minds was the last one they wanted to consider, which would be an abduction. Maybe someone lured her on the internet. And after her friends dropped her off, she left again in a second car. And this car, the driver parked in the lower parking lot near the dumpster, but who did Skylar leave with and why? So this became the foundation for a timeline of Skylar's disappearance, based on what Sheila told the police. So the timeline, 11 p.m., Skylar sneaks out of the house to joyride with her friends, and 11.45, her friends drop her off at the end of Crawford Avenue. Between 11.45 and 12.30, we don't know what Skylar was doing. And then at 12.31, Skylar's seen getting into the back seat of an unidentified vehicle. So initially the police didn't suspect anything because they knew the vehicle seen in the grainy video couldn't have been Sheila's. Not when she told Macaulay she and Rachel parked on Crawford Avenue in front of a different part of the building. So after picking up Skylar, they then turned onto Fairfield Street, which intersected with Crawford just a few feet away from where Sheila said she had parked that night. So this all made sense. The vehicle in the video couldn't have been Sheila's, and it had to be somebody else's. Yes, but within a couple of days, law enforcement realized Sheila's story sounded phony. Yeah. However, that first night, no one had any reason to believe Skylar's best friend would lie about the time Skylar snuck out or where she had parked. Mary and Dave believed her completely. I mean, to them, Sheila was still a trusted teenager, and, and as you said, almost like another daughter to them. Sure. So no one would suspect what a liar and nightmare of a human being she would turn out to be. Several teens reported receiving a text message or a phone call from Sheila about Skylar's disappearance, and all of them said the same thing. Sheila seemed nonchalant over the fact that no one could find her best friend. While Sheila was telling her friends about Skylar's disappearance, that first weekend was just a horrible blur for Mary and Dave. They both wanted to do something to find their daughter, but they felt too trapped and helpless to come up with a course of action. They felt like all they could do was cling to what the police told them. So trying to reassure Mary and Dave, the police said not to worry because Skylar had probably gone on some kind of summer getaway. Even though they knew Skylar would never be that irresponsible, Mary and Dave tried to talk themselves into believing that she had done that because the alternative was too terrifying. The police said that teenagers do this, Mary would say later, and that we should give it the weekend. So they listened. Yeah, and they had almost convinced themselves that Skylar would return home Sunday night. Her reckless spur-of-the-moment beach visit would be over, and their daughter would come home and apologize. But the whole weekend was torture for them. They sat, they waited. They wondered when they would hear Skylar's ornery laugh or see her mischievous smile. They barely noticed the influx of friends and relatives at the apartment that weekend. Every time someone knocked, every time the door opened, Dave would think, it's her, but it never was. So in the days following her disappearance, while the nieces were filled with panic, Sheila and Rachel actually showed very little concern. But the teens at Skylar's high school were coming to conclusions that the adult world wasn't going to reach for months. So the teens have an inclination. They do. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. So do you want to talk to me at all about um, adolescence and relationships? 
Did you ever deal with any patients in your practice that had these kinds of issues in high school? You must have. Well, certainly not to this extent. Well, no. Uh, but we had, it was a, a small group of girls. It was more than three. But there was one girl that the, the rest decided they needed to teach a lesson. So they tied her to a tree Wow! in the woods and left her there for an hour. During the day? Yeah. Okay. So that was the extent of it. Scary enough. But that's actually kidnapping if you keep someone right. tied up for an hour. So what happened with that? It got settled. Yeah? Were the police involved? No. Really? Really. They probably should have been. I mean, I, maybe the girl was on hurt, but that's pretty serious. We all thought the police should have been involved, but that wasn't our call. So it was the school who made the decision, or the parents? Parents. Or the parents decided just to forgive and forget? Well, they were going to work things out. Okay, <laughs> whatever that means. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of relationship with the odd one out isn't that unusual. And teens can be cruel to each other. But just to the extent this went was extreme and shocking. Yeah, this, no one would predict that. This is beyond cruel. Right. Well, on Friday, July 6th, while the nieces were out searching for Skylar, Rachel and her mom were at Cheat Lake, which was out in the suburbs. Patricia Schoff, a full-time communications sales rep, had originally planned to go out on the lake with her friend. Her name was Kelly Kearns. But for some reason, Rachel asked to come along. Rachel usually loved the chance to be home alone without her mom, but something in her demeanor made it seem like she didn't want to be alone that weekend. Patricia was happy to have her daughter along for the trip, since she was leaving for camp the next day. So while Patricia and Kelly chatted out in the sun, Kelly noticed a cut on Rachel's lower right leg down by her ankle, and she asked her, what did you do to your leg? And Rachel said that she must have scraped it on the boat motor when they were climbing into the boat. But it was a nasty cut. It was fairly deep. Mm-hmm. On Saturday, Sheila and her mom, Tara, helped the nieces go door-to-door -door canvassing the neighborhood again. Sheila was now tearful, pretty much as tearful as her mom and they both were hugging Mary and comforting her repeatedly. Tara felt terrible for Mary and Dave. She just couldn't imagine how a parent would feel in this situation. The next time Sheila stopped by the nieces, she was alone, and she asked Mary if she could sit in Skylar's bedroom. Mary told her she could, but after a while she heard Sheila crying in there, so she went in and she found Sheila sitting on Skylar's bed, hugging her pillow to her chest and crying. And Mary felt sorry for Sheila. She sat down beside her and tried to comfort her, just as she would have Skylar if Skylar was crying in her room. Right. So Sheila did appear to grieve for her missing friend. She spent hours with the nieces trying to help find Skylar. But when Mary and Dave would look back at this, they would see that her sadness was fake. Her activity online revealed that things were not what they appeared. Saturday night at 11.45, she tweeted, Tired of losing sleep over this. An hour and a half later, at 1.24, she posted another tweet. When you text me and my stomach drops to my ass, with a sad sign, like a less than, which I think is like a sad face. And that symbol meant that she didn't like that feeling. So she's not really texting about missing her friend or worrying about her friend. These are more things about her no, feeling nervous. About, about her. Yeah. And these are probably... Aimed at Rachel, of course. Sure. Her partner in crime, literally. So the officer who had taken the initial call from the nieces was Officer McCauley. Now, he was only a part-time police officer. So Schuyler's case was handed to another officer, Officer Colbank. And she thought Sheila's story was very hinky from the beginning. She found the phone records very telling. Most of the calls and texts going to and from Schuyler's phone were among her, Sheila, and Rachel. Also, Schuyler had called Sheila six times just before midnight on the night of her disappearance, and the last call Schuyler received was from Rachel. So the Star City Chief of Police, named as Chief Probst, called State Police Headquarters in Charleston twice, asking the agency to issue an, issue an Amber Alert. But the alerts were only issued for abductions, which was a status determined by state officials. And since the surveillance tapes showed Schuyler getting into a car voluntarily, both requests were denied. 
Instead, Schuyler was classified as a runaway, not an abducted teen. And as you can imagine, this was quite upsetting and frustrating for her parents. Yeah, Dave had some pretty good reasons to support that Schuyler hadn't run away. She'd left her contact lens container and lenses solution behind, as well as the charger for her phone, which was like an umbilical cord to her, wasn't something she left. She'd left her window open and carefully placed that bench outside to help her climb back in when she returned, too. And maybe most importantly, Skylar left Lilu, her dog, and her real best friend behind. So Dave said over and over that Skylar would not have left home for good without taking her dog with her. Yeah, and the FBI didn't see Skylar as a runway either. This agency gets involved in cases of missing juveniles when sexual assault, physical abuse, abduction, or internet crime is suspected. So the FBI happened to be working on an ongoing investigation in a case an hour south of Morgantown, and they began to wonder if the two cases could be connected. Aaliyah Lunsford, age three, vanished from her Lewis County home in 2011, about a year before Schuyler disappeared. The massive search for Aaliyah had lasted for weeks, but FBI agents continued working the case after searchers went home. Sadly, Aaliyah has never been found. But when they first heard about Skylar, the FBI worried there might be a serial killer in the area. One week after Skylar disappeared, more people volunteered from all over the place, and they split into teams of four and put up flyers everywhere that they could. The searchers drove up and down country roads as well as interstates that led away from Morgantown, looking for Skylar. At first, Sheila was the most persistent searcher of all. She stopped every day, usually with her mom, Tara, and her questions were always the same. Did the police tell you anything new? What have they found out? What are they telling you? So it kind of seems like she's just trying to be there so she can hear what's going on. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the undertone of it. Yeah. We're, I think we're supposed to figure that Sheila is just terribly concerned about her dear friend. Well, I think that to Mary and Dave, she seemed like a concerned friend, but looking back, they would see things differently. Sure. They also remembered that Rachel never offered to help. Mary wondered why she wasn't there, and she asked Sheila about it. Sheila said Rachel had been away at camp since the previous Saturday, which was the day after Skylar vanished. A couple of weeks later, Mary realized... She still hadn't seen Rachel, but of course she was too distracted to spend too much time worrying about it. And Officer Colbank didn't believe Sheila and Rachel's story, that they had dropped Skylar off about four blocks away for fear of waking Mary and Dave. And when she asked Sheila, she was told Skylar had been mad and had insisted on being let out there. Something about this sounded wrong to Colbank, so she had Sheila go over the entire evening again. And this is what Sheila told her. She and Rachel parked on Crawford Avenue. Skylar came out of her window, ran up the slight incline to where they were parked, and got in. They turned onto Fairfield Street, where they pretty much stayed, cruising and smoking weed on the side streets of Star City. She and Rachel were both dressed in shorts and sweatshirts, and the three girls talked about Rachel's boyfriend, Skylar's money problems, and how her shift at Wendy's that day had been so boring. Skylar wasn't on her phone much, but she seemed upset and began acting weird, which was when she insisted they drop her off away from her home. So for months, police investigated several unproductive leads in Skylar's disappearance. There was an early tip that said she had been seen in North Carolina, but that was determined not to be her. And police determined that the unknown car in which Skylar was last seen actually was Sheila's car and brought her back in for another interview. Sheila and Rachel seemed to be spending even more time together and didn't seem too bothered by their best friend's disappearance. On their social media accounts, there were only a few sporadic mentions of Skylar, whenever it seemed convenient, I guess. Daniel, the old friend of Skylar's and a co-worker of hers at Wendy's, was very persistent and kept bugging Rachel, who was in the same drama class. So he was suspicious. Anonymous Twitter accounts were set up to harass Rachel and Sheila, and whoever was behind these accounts seemed to have extensive knowledge of the case, including the ongoing criminal investigation. While Sheila seemed unmoved by all the harassment, even referring to the FBI as her buds, Rachel began to crack. 
Yeah, it was it was interesting to me. I mean, the, the amount of work on social media in, in this case. I mean, the the classmates of these two girls seemed to know what was going on or have an inclination as to what was going on from early in the course of things. Right, I think and, so. And they were pretty unmerciful. Well, they should be. And then the, these anonymous accounts, well, you almost think there was a leak in the police department or something. Could have been. And I think that the whole world of investigation, there's a whole section of it just dealing with social media and phone and texting. Yeah. It's a whole new world, really, in the last And Skylar's 20 years. parents were just absolutely inundated with shit, mm. uh, almost accusing them of causing harm to their daughter. Well, there was all kinds of stuff, yeah. 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 It would be difficult to control myself. Oh, sure. It's, it's horrible for them. So the big break in the case came when Rachel admitted that she had plotted with Sheila to kill Skylar. Now, Rachel had become increasingly erratic in her behavior uh, and to gain control over this behavior and to keep her away from Sheila and her mother Tara Rachel's mother Patricia and her father Rusty had decided to have Rusty move in with them Rusty's house had been a sanctuary for Rachel because she often fought with her mother and also living with Rusty allowed her to see Sheila more often yeah I think she kind of had the run of the house at her dad's house well yeah he was at work and pretty much let her do what she wanted he did so Rachel was unaware of her parents' plan when she and her mother were coming home on December 28th from a Christmas holiday in Virginia. But the jig was up as soon as I got to their driveway. And this is where she really pulled a nutty. She, she lost it. She totally lost it. She reacted by running around the neighborhood screaming, you're ruining my life. And as the confrontation moved inside the house, it escalated into a physical altercation between Rachel and Patricia. Eventually, Rachel barricaded herself in her room and was threatening to kill herself. The police arrived and Rachel was taken to Chestnut Ridge, a psychiatric hospital in Morgantown. And while there, Sheila, of course, grew nervous about Rachel talking. Rachel had broadcasted everything going on with this fight with her mom to Sheila over FaceTime. So Sheila tried twice to get to see Rachel in the hospital but the staff had been instructed only to allow family members to visit, and Sheila was turned away both times. So clearly, Rachel spoke while she was in the hospital and had some therapy where she actually told the truth, it seems like, because she was released from the hospital on January 3rd, and her parents immediately took her to her attorney's office in downtown Morgantown, where an interview had been prearranged with Corporal Gaskins and a federal polygraph examiner. The investigators wanted to have the interview as soon as she got out because they didn't want Sheila getting to her first. So being aware of Rachel's visit to Chestnut, the investigators were hopeful that the truth would finally come out. And it did. Only a few questions into the interview, Rachel said, we stabbed her. So now, this was shocking, right? More than shocking. I mean, they, they were thinking, the, the investigators were thinking that to, yeah. something had happened to Skylar. Yeah, like she'd overdosed and they yeah. panicked or... Yeah, you know, they might have been present for her death, but didn't cause her death. So they're thinking that, well, yeah, they'll say that she overdosed or she ran away into the woods or something and we panicked and we left. Right. But not that they purposely killed her. They didn't expect that. But Rachel told them what happened, that they had picked Skylar up after midnight, driven her to a remote area and stabbed her to death and buried her body. And when asked why they did it, the only thing she could come up with was, we just didn't like her anymore. So how sad and pathetic is that? A young person's life over nothing. Well, and they had, they had brought stuff to change clothes. I mean, this, this was... Very planned. Premeditated. Very, right? yes. So it was agreed that Rachel would take them to the body right away. The investigators, Rachel and her attorney drove in two cars, crossing the state line into Pennsylvania, and when they arrived at the location where Rachel said they had killed Skylar, it was too snowy, so Rachel couldn't pinpoint the exact spot where they'd buried her. The investigators would have to wait for the snow to melt, and she wasn't really buried, she was just kind of covered with some branches. Yeah. The investigators now knew what had happened to Skylar, but with her body still buried in the snow somewhere, they didn't have any evidence beyond what Rachel had told them. So knowing Sheila would be anxious to meet with Rachel, 
They put Rachel's room under electronic surveillance and had her set up a meeting with Sheila. But unfortunately, Rachel wasn't able to get anything incriminating out of Sheila. So Sheila was kind of smart. And I don't say that to compliment her at all. I'm just saying kind of shrewd. She was. Kind of scary for someone so young to be that shrewd, really. So a couple weeks later on January 16th, the investigators returned to the spot that Rachel, that Rachel had showed them. And this time they had a canine unit. The snow had mostly melted. So the, they're out there with the dogs. And one of the dogs lost his GPS tracker. I guess it had fallen off. And the handler was picking up the tracker and he noticed skeletal remains under a pile of branches, which did eventually turn out to be Skylar's. So six months from the time she disappeared. Yeah, of course, they couldn't tell it was her right away. They had to scientifically determine that it was Skylar, although they were pretty sure right away. So over the months that followed, though, Rachel was free while investigators were gathering evidence, not only against her, but against Sheila. Sheila must have received a warning from her attorney because she and Rachel were barely in touch after that January 3rd meeting. The morning after that meeting, she tweeted, First time I've ever been completely speechless, followed by, holy fuck. Then the next day, January 4th, investigators surprised Sheila and her family by serving a search warrant to seize every knife in the house along with Sheila's car. Yes, so on May 1st, 2013, Rachel pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. According to the court transcript, she said that she and Sheila picked up Skylar in Sheila's car, the girls drove to Pennsylvania, got out of the car, and just pretended to be hanging out. Rachel and Sheila stabbed Skylar to death on the count of three, as they had planned ahead of time. They attempted to bury Skylar's body, but, you know, they really weren't prepared to dig a hole, so they said they were unable to, and just covered her body with some branches. But she had been stabbed multiple times, and this had been planned out because they changed their clothes, like you said, cleaned up the scene. Yeah. So the court transcript indicates that other students overheard conversations between the two of them about this murder plot, but they didn't report it, thinking they were just joking. According to Rachel's plea agreement, she pleaded guilty to murder in the second degree by unlawfully, feloniously, willfully, maliciously, and intentionally causing the death of Skylar Neese by stabbing her and causing fatal injuries. And in this plea agreement, the state of West Virginia recommended a sentence of 40 years incarceration. Then in September of 2013, West Virginia prosecutors publicly identified Sheila Eddy as the second alleged perpetrator of the murder of Schuyler. And they announced that she would be tried as an adult. So she was indicted by a grand jury September 6, 2013, with one count of kidnapping, one count of first-degree murder, and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. She pleaded not guilty to all these charges. The date of the trial was originally set for January 28, 2014. However, facing the prospect of charges from both federal and Pennsylvania authorities, in addition to the West Virginia charges, Sheila pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. As a result, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Following her guilty plea, On May 1, 2013, Rachel received a sentence of 30 years in prison. She will be eligible for parole in 10 years. Both teens are incarcerated at the Lakin Correctional Center in Mason County, West Virginia. Yeah, of course, they're in their 20s now. So, like we said, an Amber Alert was not issued in Skylar's disappearance. And that was because circumstances didn't meet the four criteria for an alert to be issued. The first one is a child is believed to have been abducted. The second is that the child is under 18. The third is that the child may be in danger of death or serious injury. And the fourth is that there is sufficient information to indicate the Amber Alert would be helpful. A waiting period of 48 hours had to elapse before a teenager could be considered missing. A West Virginia state legislator introduced a bill called Schuyler's Law to modify West Virginia's Amber Alert plan to issue immediate public announcements when any child is reported missing and in danger. 
regardless of whether the child is believed to have been kidnapped. So there were opinion columns that appeared in both West Virginia and national media that supported this law. Some of which, though, also acknowledged some criticism and drawbacks of the legislation. In March 2013, the West Virginia House of Delegates approved Schuyler's law by a 98 to nothing vote. And in April, the West Virginia Senate unanimously passed that law, but they did make some minor technical changes to the bill. So there's a lot of media available on this case, and there's a lot to it that we didn't have time to get into, like the social media. If you want to look over the messages that took place, it really pastes things together in my mind pretty well. Incredible. Yeah. So in May 2013, Anderson Cooper covered this story. In 2014, Dateline NBC did an episode titled Something Wicked about this. In 2014, the Dr. Phil show covered her story, and David and Mary were interviewed on that. In April 2014, Lifetime aired Death Click, a fictional drama inspired by the story of Skylar's murder, and it's now available on Netflix if you're interested. Also in 2014, the Lifetime Movie Network has a show called I Killed My BFF, and they did an episode on Skylar which was titled Real Life Heathers. It's also been covered on ID's show, See No Evil. Uh, The Reels channel, Copycat Killers, covered her story, and this was also titled Heathers. The Oxygen channel showed her story on Snapped. That was season 18, episode 1. And there's also a book called Pretty Little Killers by Daylene Berry and Jeffrey C. Fuller. This episode of True Crime Brewery has been sponsored by ADT. ADT can design and install a smart home just for you backed by 24-7 protection. This can include doorman service and automation that unlocks the door for package deliveries, friends, or your kids. Turn down service that arms your system, locks your doors, and turns down your lights and thermostat at bedtime. This is all controlled from the ADT app or the sound of your voice. Just visit ADT.com slash smart to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. And the music for True Crime Brewery is written and produced by Tristan Capel. Please send us your comments and case suggestions for our feedback section that we have at the end of each episode. If you go to tiegrabber.com, you can leave us a voicemail. And if we play it on an episode, you get a free True Crime Brewery t-shirt. And that's good till the end of this year. Even if we play it next year, as long as it was received by the end of this year, you will get a free t-shirt. To offer support to True Crime Brewery and get access to members-only, ad-free episodes, please go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and subscribe. For a very small monthly contribution, you'll receive a package of cool TCB gifts, all access to True Crime Brewery Premium, which is our members-only show, and our undying affection. So on to feedback, Dick. Okay, we've got some voicemails. Okay, who's first? So first is Katie, who has a case suggestion. Hi there, my name is Katie, and I am a longtime listener, and I live in a beautiful little town in Southern Oregon, where I'm a local dog walker. So I spend a lot of time with you guys, and I thank you for keeping me entertained while I do hours and hours of dog walking. I just have to make a quick comment about the most recent um, podcast you guys did. I um, thought that one line was particularly hilarious because I can relate uh, completely. And that was the comment that Jill made about about all the money that was being spent on this ridiculous wedding for this do- the doctor episode that you guys just did. And how many pets you could have rescued with all that money. And I thought, you know what? We must be soul sisters because that's what, exactly what I would have done. I'm out walking dogs and I certainly would have rescued all the dogs. So I just wanted to make a quick comment about that and let you know that fellow dog lover here and just loving all the podcasts. Um, I do have a little case suggestion. I know you guys don't normally do unsolved cases. But um, when I moved to the small town that I live in, in Oregon, a couple years ago, I was told about a very tragic unsolved murder here in town. And it is still being worked on, so I don't even know if you guys can work on this. But anyways, uh, a young man, 23-year-old man by the name of David Michael Grubbs, was beheaded with a sword or a machete 
on the local bike path near a park at 5.30 p.m. That's 5.30 in the afternoon. Unbelievable. Um, on November 19th, 2011. So this actually wasn't even that long ago in all reality. So it's something that is just totally local mystery and um, very tragic. It's something it's not gotten a lot of coverage in my opinion. So I don't know. It's definitely a, a creepy little mer mystery worth looking into. Anyways, I hope that everything is going great. And thank you for all of your wonderful podcasts and keep it up. I spend a lot of time listening to you guys and I will continue to do so. Have a great day. Thanks again, guys. Bye. Thank you, Katie. And thank you for walking those dogs. You know, it's very important to walk dogs. I know for our dogs, it's the highlight of their day is when it's walk time. So you are doing good work there. And it sounds like a really good case suggestion. Well, what I looked up on this one wasn't much more than what Katie told us. Yeah, well, there's probably not a lot out there, I guess you said. Right. Yeah. It's, it's unsolved, as she said. He was just about decapitated. I guess not quite. Technical point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with a sword or some similar weapon. Wow. In broad daylight. That's so crazy. I'm planning on doing a little bit of searching and seeing if I can find more info because it sounded pretty fascinating. It's horrific, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we have another voicemail. This one is from Holly. Hi, Holly from Ohio here. I have a long commute and I love listening to your show. I was going to send in this recommendation, but now I've got the t-shirt incentive, so I'm doing it. This past week in Columbus, Ohio, Jonah Lake, a 20-year-old, was arrested in the aggravated murder of his father, Dr. Kevin Lake. This is a big local story. Dr. Lake had pled guilty to multiple federal charges of running an opiate pill mill. The opiate crisis is a huge problem in the state of Ohio. In June 2018, his son Jonah called 911 at 7 a.m. The Lakes lived in a very upscale home in New Albany, a Columbus suburb. Jonah reported a home invasion and shots fired. Dr. Lake was found dead from multiple gunshot wounds. The allegation is that his son staged the home invasion. Apparently, the mother, Dr. Lake's wife, was also at home but was not arrested. There should be a lot of information available about Dr. Lake's pill mill operations, which I think occurred in the course of his local medical clinic between 06 and 2013. Again, I thoroughly enjoy your production, especially your attention to detail and your great sense of humor. Thank you so much. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, thanks. So this, as Holly said, this, uh, nine, he was 19 year old, years old at the time. His father was awaiting sentencing for running a pill mill. He had pleaded guilty to federal charges for prescribing pain medications to hundreds of patients daily at a clinic. Wow. So he initially reported it as a home invasion. The investigation led to him being charged with the murder. He was indicted on charges including aggravated murder and evidence tampering in the shooting that occurred in June of 2017. Uh, so what was the son's motive? We don't know. It's an interesting case. And, and uh, as Holly says, I mean, this uh, pain medication, opiate stuff, is really not just Ohio's problem, but most every state's problem. Yeah, yeah. I know it was really bad in New Hampshire, and it's pretty bad in New Mexico from what I hear. So it is a nationwide problem. So that sounds like a very interesting case. I would like to hear more about that. Okay. I'll start looking some more. Okay. All right. And next we have a case suggestion again. We have another one from Katie. Another Katie. Another Katie. Okay. Let's listen. Hi, Jill and Dick. My name is Katie. I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of years and really enjoy it. I am a member of the Tie Grabber group. Um, I have a case suggestion for you that I've been meaning to send in. And so here it is. Um, this is regarding Ward Weaver. He was a man from Oregon City. And in 2002, he was, I don't know if I don't think he was convicted in 2002, but in 2002, two girls disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Um, they were linked to Ward Weaver because his daughter knew both these girls. So basically, Ashley Pond, who was 12, disappeared on her way to a bus stop. And then three months later, her classmate, Miranda Gaddis, who was 13, vanished also under very similar circumstances. Um, Miranda and Ashley went to a middle school and a dance class with Warweaver's daughter. 
In August of 2001, Ashley accused Weaver of actually of attempting to rape her, but nothing seemed to have come of that. Um, Ashley disappeared on January 9, 2002. Friends and family began to search for her, including Miranda. And then on March 8, Miranda disappeared. There was an interview. This is what kind of gets me about this one is that this guy kept showing up on TV and just seemed just like taunting people like because he was basically named a suspect in it. Um, and he just kept showing up on the news all the time. And it just seemed like he just didn't he didn't think he'd be caught. I don't know. But there was an interview with him on local news station where he was standing on top of a concrete slab that he and his son had been digging. And then um, he said that he was putting in a hot tub. And in August, they discovered Ashley's remains under that slab. And Miranda was found in a storage shed behind her home uh, around that same time. This whole case, I've never seen it on another podcast. It just has a lot. I don't, Ward Weaver and Drew Peterson, to me, seem very much like the same kind of personality. Everything I remember, because this has been a long time ago, it's 2002. Everything I remember from that case was on the news where he just seemed so blatant about it just seemed like he everybody knew he did it and we just couldn't find that you know the thing that was going to put him away anyway very sad case um two girls you know unfortunately lost their lives and this guy was just just nuts like i said though i enjoy your show (laughs) um and i hope that you look into this case and see if it would be something you'd be interested in covering um he i was also going to mention that his father i think was convicted of murder and then i think his son also wound up being convicted of murder later on with a couple other people just a very very weird family anyway that is it and i'll talk to you guys later bye all right thanks katie yeah ward weaver has been on our radar for a while it is a crazy case it sure is i mean he's i know that his father was found guilty of murder of murder mhm and I couldn't couldn't find any evidence about the son. The other thing about Ward Weaver was that he had been convicted in 1988 of assaulting two teenage girls in California. So he has this big track record anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen a couple of ID shows about him. And you got a family history. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, Just a real sicko. That's very interesting. Yeah. So that definitely should be on our schedule for 2019. We're filling it up fast. All right. So thank you, Katie. Good case. Yeah, thanks. One final voicemail. This is a comment on Dr. Macchiarini from Didi. Okay. Hi, this is Didi from Louisiana. Just wanted to let you know, Jill and Dick, I love your podcast very much. Um, it was the first podcast, true crime podcast I ever listened to, and I've been hooked ever since. I wanted to call and comment on the newest uh, episode, Bad Medicine. Any true crime stories that involve the medical field are fascinating to me, I guess because I'm a nurse. I'm more interested in the subject, I don't know. Uh, what gets me is the fact that people who do decide to enter the healthcare field do it to help people, especially doctors and I would say nurses to take oaths, do no harm. So what goes on that allows them to ignore that in their consciousness, I just don't know. But to be a doctor, to endeavor to help and heal people, only to knowingly do something to intentionally harm these patients is beyond my understanding. This guy, this doctor, he did surgery on patients knowing those prostheses would fail, hurt them, and cause their potentially cause their death. So to me, this is a special murdering asshole. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, anyway... <laughs> This was a very interesting story. Thank y'all for doing it. I would love to hear more involving medical field if that's available. Love listening to y'all both tell the stories and give thoughts and theories. I wait for Tuesdays to get here just to see what y'all have for us. So I um, guess that's it. Bye. Thanks, Dee Dee. So I do particularly have a fascination with the medical related cases as well. It's probably because I've been in that profession. How about you? Well, of course. <laughs> I've been a doctor for years. Yeah. So it, it's always interesting. I think, I and mean, Dee kind of commented on it, but I, I think that Macchiarini knew that this stuff wasn't going to work. Well, yeah, I think that was pretty clear from what I've read and seen about it. Yeah. 
which, which I think it, him... they should at least go to a trial and let a jury decide, but it seems to me like he did. Yeah. I think he, he knew that this was flawed science. So Dee Dee had some wind chimes, I think, going on there. I was wondering that. <laughs> First I thought it was like a jack-in-the-box or something, like a children's toy that was going to pop. <laughs> but I think it was just wind chimes. Yes. Okay. Anything else to say on Paolo? I think we've no, talked I, about him quite a bit. We have a lot of thoughts on him, but nothing else to say regarding Dee Dee's comment. Okay. So the two Katies and Dee Dee and Holly whose voicemails we just played, please write to me with your preferred shirt size and your address so you can get your t-shirt. And then we'll move on to the emails. Two emails. The first is from Joy. And Joy says, I love you guys. Your take on true crime is fresh and fun. I'm hoping that at some point you and Dick will take on the case of the West Memphis Three. It would be great to hear your opinions on this most controversial case. Keep up the great work and I'll see you at the quiet end. Thanks for writing in with this case suggestion, Joy. So what do you have to say about the West Memphis Three? These are three boys who, when they were teenagers, were tried and convicted in 1994 of the 1993 murders of three boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. Damian Eccles was sentenced to death. Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. was sentenced to life imprisonment, plus two additional 20-year sentences. And Jason Baldwin was sentenced to life imprisonment. During the trial, the prosecution asserted that the children were killed as part of a satanic ritual. Now, this, this is a very famous case, and there's been a number of documentaries that have explored the case. Mm -hmm. Celebrities, musicians, other people have held fundraisers in the belief that the three young men convicted of the crime are innocent. In July 2007, new forensic evidence was presented in the case. Status report jointly issued by the state and the, the defense team stated, Although most of the genetic material recovered from the scene was attributable to the victims of the offenses, some of it cannot be attributed to either the victims or the defendants. So in October of 2007, the defense filed a second amended writ of habeas corpus outlining the new evidence. And then following a 2010 decision by the Arkansas Supreme Court regarding newly produced DNA evidence and potential juror misconduct, the West Memphis Three negotiated a plea bargain. On August 2011, they entered, all of them, Alford pleas, which allowed them to assert their innocence while acknowledging that prosecutors have enough evidence to convict them. The judge accepted the pleas and sentenced them to time served, and they were released with suspended sentences, having served over 18 years in prison. Wow, but that's a long time if you're innocent. So this was all part of the whole satanic panic situation. It was. And I'm not sure if you have evidence that kind of exonerated you. Why, why would you enter an Alfred plea? I guess just to make sure you get out of prison, I, right? These are young guys, and they've yeah. already been in there half their lives. Right. So I think that is a good case suggestion. Yes, we'll be doing that. Okay. All so right. we also have a case suggestion from Danny. Danny says, my wife and I are both retired and enjoy listening to your podcast while on our daily walk. Prior to my retirement, I worked almost 35 years in the New Jersey correctional system. One of the most fascinating cases I came across in my career was that of Robert Reldon. This is an individual in the Ted Bundy mold, and you can read about him in the book, The Charmer, the true story of Robert Reldon, rapist, murderer, and millionaire, and the women who fell victim to his allure. There should be plenty of information available besides that book, and I think it will be a true crime story your listeners will enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, I started looking into this, and it, there wasn't initially that much. So I got the book, The Charmer. Oh, you did? It, it's just absolutely fascinating. It sounds like it. So I, I don't want to give too much away, but he was born Robert Nadler, N-A-D-L-E-R, and at some point, late teens, early 20s, he reversed the letters of his last name to be Robert Reldan. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that by itself was a, it's weird. a weird tidbit. Yeah. And as, as a young child growing up, he had an aunt who was beyond wealthy, filthy rich. And, and she had married into money and um, invested wisely and had a ton of dough. And when her husband died, she had even more money. And this aunt 
just doted on Robert and made sure he had everything that he could possibly want. So he was spoiled. So she didn't have any children of her own? No. Okay. And, and Robert was pretty much a punk from the start. He did a lot of petty crimes, shoplifting, other stealing things when he was a young kid, teenager. As he got older, he graduated to more serious crimes, such as rape. And then murder in the 70s, he killed two women within a two-week time period and was arrested, convicted, and he's been in prison for the last 40 years or so. So why the charmer? Was he kind of a con man? Yeah. Yeah, I find those cases fascinating. So I definitely would like to do that. I okay. think that's a great suggestion. Okay, was that all we have for today? Finish for today. Not many emails. Are we getting fewer emails, or are you just taking more space for the voicemails? I'm taking more space for the voicemails. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, keep sending in your emails and your voicemails. We really appreciate it. I think it adds a lot to our show. And also, I love to get the suggestions. A lot of these are cases we never would have found on our own. No, you're right. I mean, many of our listeners are just true crime fanatics and know a lot more about these cases than we do. And also find many obscure cases that we wouldn't have found on our own. So, Well, I think that's the kind of the added bonus. We get cases we'd never heard of that are compelling. Mm -hmm. really interesting cases to look at. Uh, And it's thanks to the people that listen to us that we get them. Otherwise, we'd never know about them. Right. And many of them even do research and give us some uh, links and things to look at. That's right. So it's wonderful. It's just a wonderful community, the True Crime Brewery community. That's why I love our fan discussion page on Facebook. I think that's just a great place for like-minded individuals to discuss these sorts of things. That's right. Well, keep those voicemails coming. The t-shirt offer is still in effect for over another month. And I think that uh, it's definitely working well. We've gotten a lot of them. So if yours isn't played, we'll probably be on a backlog for a couple of months catching up to them. Yeah, we will. But like I said, as long as we get them by the end of the year, it doesn't matter when we play them. You'll still get a t-shirt. So anything else to add today, Dickie? I think we're good for today. I think I'm going to stay at the quiet end. You're going to hang out here? I'll just pick you up later? Yeah, just send my car. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next time at The Quiet End. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.